So, when I was approached about this particular talk, I did what every great writer or preacher would do, uh, maybe every great student. Uh, I went online and I started looking up TED Talks. So in preparation uh, for like an hour or two hours, and even on my drive here today, I, up until my drive, was listening to, you guess, TED Talks. I mean, I listened to Malcolm Gladwell tell a story about David and Goliath. Then I listened to uh, B.J. Mitchell talk about death and dying. And as if, you know, that didn't help my anxiety, as if, like, I wasn't concerned about, like, you know, like, tripping and doing all this, like, you know, crazy stuff about, like, putting myself in a position where, like, I freak out on camera like I did a few months ago. I looked up on procrastination. And I realized that in all of these videos, I kept looking for everybody's voice except my own. And I know, okay, I may be the only one that struggles with listening to the voice that's our own voice. Or maybe you, like me, also struggle with that. And so before I inspire you, before I give you something to go write mom or dad about or to go tweet on social media, I want to introduce you to somebody. Three people, actually. Three people that's very familiar to me. Three people that are, let's say, let's call them my friends. First person, his name is Flash. He's a young kid growing up in the rural part of South Carolina. He's a young musician, a poet. He's an incredible, audacious kid. He has a lot of tenacity about himself. He's a young, skinny kid. Uh, and then, you know, as if that wasn't, you know, enough for him to make himself like bright in uh, the world, he was a kid who loved football, loved sports. His favorite athlete was Reggie Bush. And for those who are football fans, his other favorite athlete was Percy Harvin. He remembered when Percy Harvin, uh, playing against Ohio State, um, took, you know, this kickback, or he uh, changed the game, but he was, like, hurt. And he remembered something about Percy that he never wanted to forget. He wanted to remember that Percy, in the midst of his struggles, in the midst of his pain, he found a way to continue to show up in the world. Well, this young kid who found his name, Flash, given a nickname by his friends, was in the position of Percy Harvin and Reggie Bush. It was a hot August afternoon, the perfect Friday of all Fridays. The ball is kicked. He takes the ball in his hand. 95 yards later, they call his name, and he has scored the touchdown. His teammate goes and grabs him and picks him up. And now he feels as if he's a superhero. Instead of the name Flash being for that DC comic who has all this speed, this is now this young kid's name, and he finally feels like somebody who matters. He's not the only one with a nickname. Many of us, we found ourselves with nicknames as well. Some of us are called Scotty, or some of us are called uh, uh, Jimmy, or some of us, like my granddaddy, it's called Cut Sugar. And he found out a hard, important lesson as well, is that the game ends and life begins. And sometimes the nickname is a part of us that other people created. And it becomes a convenient mask to hide who we really are. That young kid on the biggest game, biggest day of high school, decided not to participate in the biggest moment of a high school football player's life, signing day. And now he has to deal with the regret of not living up to the name that other people gave him. But being the audacious kid that he was, he understood that where he came from People, being black and from the South and from the rural area, understood that sometimes the smallest of people have had to overcome the most insurmountable of odds. So he got this dream. He wanted to become a football player. Actually, he had this audacious belief that he shouldn't just go to the next level. 
but that he belonged on it. Some things had to happen. He had to reinvent himself. Now this young kid, Flash, goes to this college campus. He shows up on the first day in loafers, <laughs> a white t-shirt, uh, and some khaki shorts. Definitely not the, um, uh, uh, the attire for a young kid who is like one of the top players in South Carolina uh, who wants to play on the highest level. He's in the hot August afternoon sun once again, but now at the big, one of the biggest universities in the country. And instead of Flash... His name is now Stu. And Stu goes on to have an incredible career at this university. But in the most important moment of his life, when he has built this whole thing, he's put on scholarship, he's starting in the game, he finds himself back at square one. Another young man comes in. And instead of being a young, mature man, who have had to overcome insurmountable odds, who should have known that sometimes in life you just have to figure out how to be strong and how to be courageous like his mom would say in the Bible. He threw out the Bible. And all he had is himself. And in this moment of struggle, instead of figuring out a way to be like Flash, to dash, and to be a hero in another person's story, the person he became, Stu, is now someone who has found themselves in a hole and quitting. He's in church, like many people who are at the hardest points of their life are. He's in church. And he's not just at any church. He's at a white church. A young black kid from the rural south goes into the white church and is charismatic. And, and now, once again, he feels the thrill of being somebody who is wanted. Until the death of Alton Sterling and Philando Castile and then Donald Trump. He's gone from being flash to stew. And now he's in an environment where the people who he thought accepted him for who he was, only saw the color of his skin and could only see somebody who reminded them of the thing they wanted to run from most, the distance between their bodies and their realities in this country. This young man is married now, Stu is married now, and he goes home and gripes to his wife and complains about what's going on in this church world. Once again, running from the person he is. He shows up at work and his co-workers are talking about the death. And he starts celebrating like, oh, the world is better than it is. Oh, white people are accepting me. I'm preaching. I'm teaching. I'm the first person. And then his sister, his friend, Michaela, says, Stu, you think they love you? They only like you for what you give them. And that young man curled up once again like that young kid who took the football 95 yards, went through the season, and now and in a moment again where he feels rejected. This young man is angry at his coworker, at his friend. He goes home to his wife and gripes and complains to her once again. And she tells him the one thing he doesn't want to hear most. You're always listening to other people when I've been telling you this the whole time. And he wonders if his life is a forever continual cycle of listening to the voice of other people rather than the voice in his own heart. Like any young good Bible reading brother, he goes to the Bible in his hard time and he reads the story of Samuel. 
how uh, of Samuel and Saul. He goes to his Bible trying to convince God that if I can pray a little bit more and read a little bit more Bible, then finally, finally I'll get the life that I wanted the whole time, a life of affirmation, a life of love, a life of dignity, a life where young kids, where I come from, actually make it out and make something of themselves. And so he reads the story of Samuel and Saul. And Saul is anointed as king. And God tells that young man, Saul, through Samuel, that you're going to be king. But I need you to go some places. And I need you to meet some people. And so this young brother, being in the white church, being at the white university, trading his own self-love and self-acceptance for the affirmation of others who just simply concern about his performance and production, reads a story and realizes that the person other people created through the nickname is not the person he should be. And so like Saul, when the Bible says that Saul has to reinvent himself, this young man, too, must go through the process of reinvention. Now, before people think that this process of reinvention is just something that's easy, mind you, it's a hard process. It's a courageous process. It's a process that takes a lot of gut, a lot of intuition. But this young man, being a young, audacious kid who took the ball 95 yards to a touchdown, who goes on the highest level of football to play football and earns a scholarship and starts, and now back in this position where he feels like a young, vulnerable kid who does not know where to go, he believes that there can be something that happens to him if he just find a way to trust himself and so like Saul he goes to Rachel's tomb which is James Baldwin for him he reads Baldwin's the fire next time and the passage reads it was intended that you would perish but you did not know from whence you came and you know where you can go and then he has to go to um, Gibeah, as Saul did, to experience another type of a experience to experience another type of relationship with God. See, the God that he was introduced in Dwight Church was a God who simply concerned about power and control. And the God he must meet in his own reinvention must be a God who loves him for who he is. As Toni Morrison would write in her wonderful novel, Paradise, that that Jesus that those black kids were introduced to needed to know that they didn't have to prove or work for their dignity, but they already had it and they simply had to display it. And so like Saul, he does the thing that is most courageous of all. He leaves some things behind. And if we are to reinvent ourselves like this young kid, sometimes we have to realize that some places we've convinced ourselves we are or must be is actually not the place that would allow us to grow. It may be good for a season, but it's not good for a lifetime. And so the young kid does what he only know how to do in a season of trauma. Instead of a ball, he picks up a pen and he remember what he does with his hands. This young kid becomes a writer and as best he can, he tries to figure out through all this reading and through all this studying how he can take back the power of his own story because he understood that if you don't have the power of your own story, in your own hands, others will tell it however they want to with any, without any regard to how you feel or how it makes you look. And so he goes on this journey where he's determined to take the pen that is in his hands and the dreams that is in his mind and the things that are on his heart and he determines to ascend the highest mountain of writing. But he did not lose something that made reinvention very hard. 
He never lost the insecurity that believed the nickname mattered more than who he really was. So I was talking to my friend about this young kid, and I asked him, what is the difference between the young kid who comes from the rural area and goes and makes something of himself and has to be done with football and, and finds a way to remain open to the present and open to the future possibility of himself and what he can accomplish in his life versus a kid who goes home and struggle. Same situation, but goes back home and has to figure out life for himself and he struggles with that process. And I asked him, is it intuition? He says, nah, because we all came from the same place. So the thing we said is that what separates them is not skill set, it's not intuition. It's one kid has learned the language of grief and the other one has not. You want a kid to grow. You put them in situations where they have to trust their intuition. You want a kid to live. You put them in situations and in a com community and environment where they learn the language of grief. But that young kid, Flash, the young kid, Stu, actually showed up today. That kid's name is actually Dante. In this picture, young 16-year-old holding a deck of cards, playing a game of spades, has a scully cap on with his cousin and his friends. Young, audacious kid who has had to overcome insurmountable odds, had to trust and believe in himself, have had to be a light for other people, but who also exist in a place where he feels like the weight of the world on his shoulder is too much to bear, like so many other kids. But in his hand is that deck of cards. And of course, those hands don't catch balls no more. And of course, that hand do right right now. But I'll go back to this picture of this young kid holding the deck of cards, faking it until he make it, figuring out somehow how to play the game, never knowing what deck what cards he'll be dead in life, but figuring out a way to bet on the hand that he dealt. Because he learned through all those situations that Flash gonna go, Stu gonna go, but he always remains the Dante he really is. He learned that when you bet on yourself, you trust yourself, you play the hand you dealt, you reinvent yourself, it is always returning back to who you know you are. Realizing like Saul did, that you gotta play your hand because you just might lose. That's life, but you just might win. That's freedom and the power of self-reinvention. Thank you.